Hello lovely viewers, you are most welcome to our channel Poetry Online. In this video, we shall be presenting to you the summary, analysis, themes, characters, literary devices of the story Home Sweet Home by Ken Saruwiwa. Kindly subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon to get updates on all our new videos. Once again, let us assure you of a very interesting discussion. Get ready for this lesson. Ken Saruwiwa, in full, Kenule Bison Saruwiwa, was born in October 10, 1941, Bori, near Potakot in Nigeria. He died in November 10, 1995, Potakot. He was a Nigerian writer and activist who spoke out forcefully against the Nigerian military regime and the Anglo Dutch Petroleum Company, Royal Dutch Rochelle for causing environmental damage to the land of the Ogoni people and its native river state. Ken Saruwiwa was educated at the government college, Umiahia, and at the University of Ibadan. He briefly taught the University of Lagos before joining federal forces in the Civil War in the late 1960s. Afterwards, he worked as a government administrator until 1973 when he left to concentrate on his literary career. His first novels were Songs in a Time of War and Soldier Boy, both published in 1985. The latter, written in Pigeon English, satirized corruption in Nigerian society. He reached his greatest audience with Bansi and Company, a comedic television series that ran for some 150 episodes in the 1980s. He was also a journalist and wrote poetry and children's stories. From about 1991, he devoted himself full-time to the cause of the Ogoni, a minority ethnic group that numbered about 500,000 people. In mid-1992, he broadened the reach of the movement for the survival of the Ogoni people, an organization he led. In particular, he focused on Britain, where Shell, had one of his headquarters. He criticized the destructive impact of the oil industry, the main source of Nigeria's national revenue, on the Niger Delta region, and demanded a greater compensatory share of oil profits for the Ogoni people. As a result of mountain protests, Shell suspended operation in Ogoni lands in 1993. Ken Saruwiwa was arrested in 1994 after the deaths of four Ogoni chiefs at a political rally in a trial by a special tribunal that was denounced by a foreign human rights group, he was found guilty for alleged complicity in the murders. His execution by hanging, along with those of eight fellow activists, aroused international condemnation and led to calls for economic sanctions against Nigeria, which was suspended from Commonwealth a day after the executions. Shell later announced his commitment to a natural gas project worth nearly $4 billion, one of the largest foreign investments in Nigerian history. In 2009, Shell paid $15.5 million US dollars in an out-of-court settlement intended to resolve the lawsuits brought against it in 1966 on behalf of the members of Ken Saruwiwa's family and others. Shell accused in the lawsuit of being complicit in human rights abuses in Nigeria, and in 1995, executions denied any wrongdoing. Some of his literary works are Mr. B Again, The Transistor Radio, Soldier Boy, A Month and a Day, Bassi and Company, and Silence to be Treason. And today, we are going to discuss the story, Home Sweet Home. In Home Sweet Home, Ken Saruwiwa shows how traditional Nigerian culture engages in the oppression of women. It is a pessimistic tale about an educated Nigerian woman visiting home after completing a tertiary education, only to find out that her best friend has been banished or driven from the village for bearing twins. Ken Saruwiwa shows that modern progress is helpless 
or insufficient to change the living conditions for the women of Dukana in the face of their narrow-mindedness and arrogance. The story of Home Sweet Home begins with the excitement of a young woman going to her hometown after graduating from a tertiary institution. This young lady is a narrator of the story whose name remains unmentioned throughout the narrative. She is excited about going home, and what's more, she is going to stay and teach in her alma mater. She is equally excited about meeting her mother and her best friend Sira, who is full of the latest gossip in Dukana. She has to use the only means of transport, which is called progress, to go to Dukana. The corrupted spelling of the lorry shows the extent of illiteracy and ignorance in Dukana and their corrupted and outmoded cultural practices which makes Dukana far away from the word progress. That is to say, right from the beginning of the story, the writer, with the corrupted spelling of the word progress, informs readers that all is not well with Dukana. That is to say, readers should look out for the ignorance of the villagers as well as the narrator despite her level of education. With a carefully selected choice of words and vivid imagery, Ken Sarawiwa depicts the hopelessly backward life of the people of Dukana. Readers of the story are shocked at the pride of the narrator as well as the townspeople in Dukana when they know very well that all is not well with them. The narrator begins her narration by telling us about the pride of Dukana, which is progress. Progress was Dukana's pride, as only fast link with the modern world of Bricktown, where shit bed and foreign goods were bought and sold. It made a journey daily and was much valued by all. This is their only means of transport. So, it is only to be expected that the patronage will be high. She bought a precious and varied cargo of rice, salt and beans, cuttings of soap and sugar, some yams and cassava, a basket of fowls tied by their legs, loudly protesting their temporary imprisonment, a few goats, two stand to bleed, and men and women pressed together on the wooden benches in the body of the lorry like fish hung on a string to dry. I sat in the front seat beside the youthful driver who wore his cap facing backwards. It is clear from all indication that progress is fully packed. Notice how the cap of the driver is facing backwards. It is symbolic to the backwards, miserable, retrogressive and hopeless life of the people of Dukana. The narrator expresses her joy and pride in their only means of transport. I was happy it was available, but for it, the journey to Dukana will be intolerable. The journey to Dukana is not one that the narrator is excited about due to the poor road system coupled with the rickety bus. She goes to visit her mother once a year, but now that she has completed college, where she has trained to be a teacher, she is going back to her village, Dukana, to render her services there. What made the bumpy, dirty ride worthwhile was the thought that, at the end of it, there will be Mama smiling and happy to see me, embracing and hugging me, and walking me home by the hand. Ken Sarawiwa immediately establishes the intimacy between mother and daughter. He equally informs us of another thing that motivated her to go on such a tiresome journey. I always look forward to, to seeing my childhood friend Sira, who though our paths had diverged, was still my best friend. We had attended school together and we loved each other, even as sisters. Like most Dukana girls, her education had been terminated abruptly. She now had four children and was again pregnant when last I had seen her. Sarah was always the one who regaled me with tales of buffoonery, of Dukana's wags, Duzia, and Boom, and was always full of the latest town gossip. This particular trip to Dukana is one that excites the narrator a lot. She says, 
I had reason to be more excited than usual about going home. I had concluded my study at long last, and I was returning home to teach in Dukana's only school, St. Dominic's, my alma mater. I cherished the idea that I was going to give back to my home, and I was glad that I was going to live in Dukana and be part of the community, for Dukana is home. And as everyone will proudly tell you in this part, home is home. The answer in this extract introduces us to one of the problems of Dukana, which is the foolish pride in tradition which has nothing good to offer the people. The irony of this is that, with all the exaggerated pride in Dukana, it has only one school. Ken Sarowiwa gives a clear description of the arrogance and pride of the people which prevents them from benefiting from Western ideas and technology. The arrogance and pride of the people of Dukana are not presented completely negative. Pride and arrogance preserves a town's sense of worth, identity, and rich cultural heritage. However, that of Dukana has gone beyond bounds. Despite the level of education of the narrator, she shares the same ideas the illiterates in Dukana hold about Dukana. To them, there is no place like Dukana, and nobody ever dared to contradict this narrative, even when the reality says otherwise. This scripture saying means that it is far better than all those places you had visited or read about, that the death in which it dwells comfortably is to preferred to the paved streets of the best cities of the world and its mud houses greater and more beautiful than the palaces of kings and queens of other lands. And how could anyone disagree? For to disagree was to be disloyal to communal wisdom and to be disloyal to wisdom so carefully distilled through the ages was ignorance. And ignorance is a deadly sin in Dukana. Another thing in Dukana that a narrator brings up is the restrictions placed on people as to what they can say and what they cannot say. The words of the elders are considered sacred. That is, one cannot question, argue, or disobey them. Mama had advised me often to get to understand Dukana, to know all the men and women, the rich and the poor, the strong and the weak, the juju priest and the Christian evangelist, the wicked and the kind, the very genie of the town. This is because it is only in this way that I will know what to do, what to say, when to say it, and to whom, and thus be saved from the sin of arrogance. Mama's counsel was law, the more demanding of obedience because it was given in a soft, kind, reasonable way against which it was impossible to argue. The narrator then shares that, due to her numerous travels out of Dukana, as the light had diminished in my eyes and comparison had dimmed its supposed qualities, she now transcends heavily on those who criticize Dukana, calling them ill-informed malicious people for sharing their honest view on the reality on ground. The pride in Dukana prevent natives of Dukana from accepting anything negative about the village. Some critics consider Dukana a clearing in the tropical rainforest peopled by three or four thousand men and women and children living in rickety mud huts and making a miserable living from small farmlands in the forest or from fishing in the steamy creeks around the village. Others who are not natives of Dukana think that the absence of a health clinic, of a good school, of pipe-borne water, of electricity was a blight on the town and would think it primeval, but the narrator strongly disagrees with that. Such ill-informed malicious people might look at as emaciated illiterate population and have said that there was malnutrition, that disease was rampant, that life in its inhabitants was brutish and short, and they would dismiss it 
as Zoom, in a modern world where man was headed for space, and science has transformed man's ability to control his environment, no one worthy of his or her name, and who owed any allegiance by birth to Dukana, could be expected to disagree with such a viewpoint, and I for one could not agree. The narrator goes through a considerable length to explain why Dukana should not be considered primitive and backwards. 1. The chief of Dukana lived in a palace. The occasional letters from a district administrator was addressed to the palace. 2. Their elders sat in a council of chiefs, handing out justice according to Prince Tan and unwritten laws. 3. Dukana had fought and won wars against neighboring kingdoms. 4. She has preserved her independence for time immemorial. 5. They live peacefully. 6. The people of Dukana feed themselves. 7. They went about their daily businesses in tranquility. 8. Their school was duly approved by the government. 9. There was a lorry in Dukana. 10. But not the least, they had a source of water. In short, if anyone dare suggest that Dukana was not a kingdom equal to any other on earth, we poured scorn and contempt on him. The driver of the lorry is a proud native of Dukana who will seize any opportunity he gets to inform people that he comes from Dukana. His driver was a son of the soil. That is to say, his umbilical cord was buried in Dukana. He wished everyone to know the fact. Don't talk when a freeborn is talking. He would gruffly shout at the conductor. I could see that he wanted to impress me. He yelled at his brakes. He exhorted progress to move like a lady, a fine lady, an educated lady. He cursed the goats and chickens which crossed the road leisurely, oblivious of the power of progress and himself to inflict instant pain and death. The author continues his description of the abject poverty these people are faced with. We drove past farms planted with a mixture of yams, cassava, maize, pepper, and melon, mostly stunted and crying for fertilizer. We went swiftly past men riding rickety bicycles and women with large bundles of fire or huge basins on their heads and babies tied to their backs with dirty rags. The narrative shifts to the plight of women in rural areas. These women are seen carrying large bundles of firewood or huge white basins on their heads and babies tied to their backs with dirty rags. Once in a while, a building of modern construction, properly painted and maintained, will peep out of the bush, a reminder of other possibilities. Now and again, we will drive past a gas flare, reminding us that this was oil-bearing country and that from the bowels of this land came the much sought after liquid which fueled the wheels of modern civilization. Here, the writer indirectly expresses his view or opinion on this debate of whether the discovery of oil or natural resources in Africa is a blessing or a curse to the people. The oil-bearing country can be said to be Nigeria. The problem here is that the discovery of this much sought liquid or natural resource does not bring the envisioned development, progress and comfort. The people still live in abject poverty, despite the rich endowments in the land. The knowledge of this makes the narrator sad about the kind of life the villagers were living. I felt then that excruciating pain which knowledge confers on those who can descend the gulf which divides what is and what could be. And my mind drifted to the men and women of Dukana, acting out their lives against a backdrop of great forces they would never understand. As they continued the journey, 
The narrator slept off and woke up when they got to Dukana. The elaborate description, coupled with a choice of words, tells a lot about the people and the kind of poverty that the whole community wallows in. Nothing seems to be right about this village whose members are so proud of it. It is a village where time doesn't really matter and building a brick house is the tax of a lifetime. On all sides of the opening were mud houses of a square construction covered by raffia palms. Now and again, in the confusion of houses, was the odd mud house covered with rusty corrugated iron sheets and more rarely a brick house unplastered and unpainted. Its windows bordered with planks or old newspapers turned dulled yellow. As expected, the narrator's mother was waiting when progress arrived. She had been waiting all afternoon. The narrator climbed out of her seat and fell into her mother's arms. We immediately feel the love between mother and daughter. The two were rudely interrupted by Dozia, a clown in Dukana. Dozia and Boom helped the narrator to carry her luggage home. In the house, a crowd of people were gathered in her mother's room, waiting to warmly welcome her. They were all proud of her for successfully completing school and acquiring the new knowledge. And to crown it all, she is coming to use the knowledge in Dukana. She has returned home to plant some new seeds in the Dukana earth. The description of the villagers screams nothing but poverty. Yet, readers are tempted to ask why they are so proud of their hometown Dukana. They came in their usual assortment of rags, guns picked out from stalls of second-hand clothing traders, singlets bearing the words, Oxford University, melted blouses, some women wore shirts that were meant for men. One of them was an printed cotton nightgown that had faded beyond recognition. The men tied loin cloth round their waist. Some had neither shirts nor singlets. During this meeting, a lot is revealed about Dukana, a village that is hungry for progress. Yet, the people are not ready for the changes that comes with modernity and scientific innovations and ideas. We are poor and we are ignorant, but we know a good thing when we see it, even though it is beyond our reach. You are going to change the life of the woman in Dukana, but whatever you do, don't seek them to disobey their husbands. I'm not going to spend the rest of my life judging cases of wife beating. Dozia in this extract expresses the misconception the villagers have about educating a girl child. They view education as a tool that makes women rebellious and as such subject to beating by their husbands. He is well aware of the fact that the narrator is going to change the lives of the women in the community, but he cautions her not to teach them to disobey men. I say, I hate all wife beaters, and I hate beaten wives. I don't touch them with the smallest of my flabby toes. Another issue that is raised by Dusia is the violence against women. That is to say, women are beaten by their husbands in Dukana. However, Dusia does not subscribe to the idea of wife beating. That is to say, in the rural areas, it was common to hear of a man beating his wife. The writer puts this in his work to condemn all those who engage in this violent and inhuman activity. His condemnation of violence against women is emphasized by the fact that even the famous clown or buffoon of Dukana doesn't subscribe to that idea. The narrator and her well wishes together dance as a way of celebrating her achievement they prayed for the narrator and Dukana as a whole and retired to their various houses. As they sang, they danced their prayers, their wishes and their hopes, in the twirling and twisting of waist and shoulders, in the rhythmic beating of the simple drums, 
I heard the call of nativity, and I saw what united me with them inextricably, a bond which neither education nor distance nor time could destroy. And I leapt to my feet and joined them in their expression of joy. In the evening, the narrator is now alone with her mother as they eat a simple meal made of pounded yam and hot peppery fish broth. They had hardly finished their dinner when Wally, Mama's best friend, came in. At first, the narrator didn't recognize her, but when she spoke, the narrator knew it was Wally. The two hugged each other while Wally sobbed involuntarily. The narrator noticed how much Wally had aged. Her face was wrinkled and grizzled, and there were many gray spirals in her hair. Wally says, Ah, my beauty, my lovely girl, the song in my heart, the joy of my life, you are back. How you have grown, the baby of yesterday, is today's elegant woman. She said half to me and half to mama. It's incredible, mama said with a hint of pride. Sarah was Wally's only daughter. She and the narrator grew up together and had attended school together. Sarah had not been able to complete her elementary schooling, although she was a brilliant girl. It was said that her mother could not pay her fees, but that was only an excuse. Her parents had wanted her to have children, to procreate, so that the family would not die off, and she had to obey them. The funny thing about this is that she had not been married, and her four children were by four different men. The narrator even suspects that her fifth pregnancy was by a fifth man. In Dukana, the women are limited by outmoded cultural practices, a savage and retrogressive society that sees a woman's potential in terms of giving birth or procreation. The story comes to a sad end when the narrator is informed that her friend, Sarah, gave birth to twins and as such, she no longer lives in Dukana. That is, the title of the story, Home Sweet Home, is ironic in a way because no one will ever see Dukana as a sweet place when one of her members was banished or driven out of the village for giving birth to twins, something she has no control of. For a while I could not sleep, I lay staring into the darkness, and out of the bowels of the night came the rhythms of drums in the distance, the hooting of owls, the swooping and beating of birds, the burping of toads, the humming of nine birds, and the words of a mournful song welcoming me to embrace the spirit of my home, my sweet home. Let's now consider the major themes of the story. The need to abolish outmoded cultural practices. There is no place like home. The need for formal education. Progress comes with attitudinal changes. Let's now consider some of the literary devices employed in the story. Metaphor We come across metaphor in the following extracts. I think Dukana could be floating on a sea of wealth. Its driver was a son of the soil. That is to say, his umbilical cord was buried in Dukana. Mama's counsel was law. Rhetorical question. And how could anyone disagree? Don't you see her mother hovering hawk-like around her? You think she will allow anyone to touch a pin of her daughter's? Symbolism. The vast progress represents the people of Dukana and the progress they desire. However, the bus is nothing to write home about. Personification 
Progress plastered lazily down the long, dirty road, which stretched before us like the coated tongue of an alien man. A bus which has given human attributes. We drove past sleepy little villages, hacked out of the forest, fondly embracing the earth and foliage. Dukana slack off noisily, the surrounding darkness swallowing them as they disappeared from Mama's house. Similarly, and the men and women pressed together on the wooden benches in the body of the lorry like fish hung on string to dry. Progress plattered lazily down the long dirty road which read before us like the coated tongue of an alien man. He yelled at his brakes. He exhorted progress to move like a lady, a fine lady, an educated lady. She did not eat much and took her leave as soon as she had finished, slinking into the night like a cat. Hyperbole. For you must understand that Building a brick house in Dukana is a tax of a lifetime. Onomatopia Progress plattered lazily down the long dirty road. Don't talk when a freeborn is talking, he gruffly shouted at the conductor. Progress has screeched to a stop. I sprang to my feet and fell into her outstretched arms. Thanks for watching this video. Please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe and share this video.